got another amplifier here, which is the Key 200.4, and I've got a different fixed resistive load already hooked up to it because it doesn't run on a one ohm load, it actually runs on a four ohm load per channel. So I'm gonna lift up off the floor. It's already wired up to the key. This is another fixed resistive load bank. So if, if you guys didn't get a good view of the one that's over here because it's kind of hidden by the meters, this is what it looks like. This is a big silver box. It's an aluminum heat sink. And inside of it, these are lab grade resistors. And, and these are what we use in the labs here day in, day out. Uh, maybe even bigger versions of these for amplifier testing. But this is what we have over in the studio. It's got speaker wires connected to it and that's going to the key amplifier. So I'm just gonna set it up here. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move the, the probes for the, uh, the AMM1, I'm gonna move them to this resistor bank and I'm gonna move the oscilloscope probes to this resistor bank so we can now measure this amplifier. So that's what I'm gonna do real quick. So fun fact to. here, these resistors are used in a couple of other applications. Anybody wanna guess what they're used for outside of the audio world? Do, 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 do. Trains, the brakes for trains. trains. Also really? the brakes for the elevators. They use resistors like that to help dissipate the heat for the brakes. I'll be darned. Well, I didn't know that. I just learned something, too. You can uh, learn more next time from the Big D <laughs> learning session from Big Dummy University. Big D University. We cover all of the bases that interest you. That's right. right so I, Literally. So I, and speaking of bases, <laughs> we expect at the end L7X hooked up for the Do It Bump Dose segment. I've already seen them in the chat. I haven't really seen them say that, but I'm going to ask for them. You want to do it bump section for L7X? Yeah, sure do. Got to fit that I in. Think, Put I you think on the we'll spot. I think we'll have to find a way to make that happen now that you put me on the spot. Thanks. I appreciate it. No, no worries at all. I'll, I'll hand deliver it in my own vehicle. All right. Okay, so if I've got everything set up here properly, I'm gonna flip the switch, there'll be no smoky smoky. And that's the other thing doing these things live. Sometimes you think you get it hooked up right and you don't. If you're recording these to edit later, you can hide all your mistakes. So uh, here we're I've never blown an amp, Kip. I've never, <laughs> never hooked it up wrong. It just doesn't happen. We're all perfect. Ever. Yeah, no. exactly. That's what I like people to think about me. So back to the meter. So I'm gonna set the max on that. I'm gonna clear. I've got to say, while Kip is doing this real quick, props to the marketing guy for being able to do all this is all i got to say. Props to the marketing guy. You know, I started off as an installer and, you know, an audio enthusiast years ago. I mean, it, very young. I started into anything electronic. And it's uh, my father. I have to blame my father and my grandfather. They always instilled in me that when you take a new job, it doesn't mean you forgot the one you left. And so you take that with you. They had a real strange way of instilling me how to respect and honor other people. Uh, my grandfather says, I don't care if you're getting introduced to the president or the janitor, you do, they deserve a firm handshake and a look in the eye. And so I, that's kind of how I am, even though I you know, do what I do on a daily basis and this being part of it, I'm still a tech guy at heart too and it's never gonna go away. <laughs> we can still give you a prop, so. And I'll take them all day long. Okay, so if I got it right here, Let's find out. We're going to do a ramp up on this. We've got the same setup, except this is on the key 200.4, and this is a four channel amplifier. We're looking at just one channel. Uh, the key amplifier is not a bridgeable amplifier. I know a lot of times, Derek, on your channel, you'll take four channel amps and bridge them to two channels to show all channels working. So you'll just yes. have to trust me that all four channels work the same way because we're just looking at one channel. Uh, I could show you the other channel because I have two channels loaded down. I've got the front two channels loaded down. The back two channels are just not doing anything right now. So there's all the stipulations, caveats, terms and conditions in the contract. Let's see what happens. So I'm gonna ramp it up. And no, there it just went, there, there it came on. I'm, I'm barely, t there I'm tickling the clip light. So on the O-scope we can see that the waveform is clipped off. We're tickling the clip light over here on the SMD meter and that amplifier is right at 53 watts of power. So the key 200.4, we rate that amplifier at 50 watts by four, and you can see it's doing 53 watts of power. That's right at it, that's what you want. Right at it, and current draw, uh, 13 amps. So now that was just with two channels loaded down. So once you actually put the other two channels online, you'd probably be looking more around, around 20 amps of current draw-ish is what you'd be looking at with all four channels making power. So understand we're only loading down and powering two channels right now. So with that current draw, make understand that's just with two channels at idle and two channels making full power. And we're gonna go in and do another run.
There we go. Tickle the clip light. You can see we're clipping over here on the way. Before I get my finger out of the way, sorry I keep pointing to that. I feel like I'm helping, but actually my finger gets in the way. 53 watts of power, clipping, and again, 13 amps of current draw out of the system. And he let it run for an extra 30 seconds and no smoke. No smoke. I mean, it's, uh, you know, we've talked about at some point we may hook an amplifier up and just let it run during the whole show and see what happens. <laughs> Since it seems to be what we do here. I mean, that, that goes along a lot with the reliability. You know, if you're, if you're doing things like that, then you're putting the amplifier through the stages that most people don't put them through. And if it can last, then that just tells you they're built tough. You know, what we'll do here, since you bring that up, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna run this up for one more dyno test. So we're gonna just do a, a full run up here. Uh, Ernie, if you wanna go to camera three and get a close up on this, I'm gonna just run it up. You know, I did three tests on the other one, so it's not a fluke. So here we go again. There I go, tickled there. Clip like just came on, so I tickled it. So again, clipped off waveform. You can see it in the oscilloscope that we're at clipping. Over here on the SMD AMN1, we're at 53 watts of output power. And again, 13 amps of current is what we pulled through the fluke clamp meter uh, for amp amperage draw. So what I'm gonna do here now is I'm actually going to change modes on the meter. This'll, this'll be where I get egg on my face tonight. <laughs> Okay, so here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna bring over here. Which mode are you in, Kip? I am in real-time power mode right now, which means it's not gonna do a freeze and hold reading. It's actually showing power, so if I ramp this up and down, it doesn't freeze it, it's showing me power continuously. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run this up to 49, there's 50. 50, 51, it's actually doing real-time power, 48, 49, 50, it's bouncing back and forth. You can see it's clean over here on the oscilloscope and this amplifier is making 50, 51 watts of power. It's 841 on my clock, let's let it run. That's ah, good, let's let it run. I need, to, I need to warm up my steak dinner here in a little bit, that'll be a great place to do it. So, uh, Ernie, if you can, could you put that in window in window, actually put that scope and the SMD meter and the, the current meter, could you put that up in the bottom window and just let it sit there? We're at 841, we're gonna just let this run for a little bit. And while I'm doing that, what I wanna do, besides look at the grin on Derek's face. <laughs> He's trying to blow it up, people. We're gonna see what happens. We're at 841, we'll, we'll see what we get here. I'm going to actually bring up, and I'll need Ernie to bring this up as an asset on the screen as well, if he can. He can put this in place of the big screen. Let me know when that's up and running. And this is actually a spreadsheet that I got from Joe Hobart. Thanks for that, Ernie. So this is a spreadsheet I got from Joe Hobart. Now we've talked about amplifier testing tonight, and of course amp dynos and oscilloscopes. Uh, the, the amplifier dyno that Tony, uh, Diamori has created, and then Steve Mead, you know, they, got, they promote and use it. It's a fantastic tool. I mean, if you guys are wanting to set the gains quickly and accurately and know what you're doing, uh, their distortion detector tools and this AMM1, I don't know that there's an easier to use tool out there. Uh, I still like an O-scope, I'm kind of old school and I like an O-scope, but guys who can use the AMM1 don't understand O-scopes a lot of times. I mean, I've even had to do some training lessons with some of the guys here on how to use an O-scope in the back. Uh, you know, the probes are different, sometimes they're difficult to get on, it's just a different tool, but I grew up on O-scopes. What's cool is that Tony and Steve have taken what an O-scope lets you see and found a quick and easy way to put it into numbers, digits, and lights so that anyone can use it. And I, th I think they deserve a shout out for that. 100%, yeah, it goes back and Kip, you know, that, for me, it's the visual thing. Watching the numbers count up is like watching the cars go down the drag strip, right? So sure. seeing the numbers count, people like to see that. Um, so that that's why I enjoy doing it that way. Other than doing both, sometimes I incorporate, just like you did tonight, incorporate the, um, the O-scope as well. But not all the time because I'm fully trusting the tools and what they do and what they're showing. 
Right. And, uh, get them calibrated every couple of years, too. So just to have them check out and make sure they're still 100% reliable. So this is actually a sheet I got from Joe Hobart, and Joe Hobart is one of, uh, not just an engineer, but he's the guy who's in charge of the engineers back in R&D on the electric or electronics side of the house here at Kicker. And so I just wanted to go through this sheet and kind of show you the things. We use other gear back in the labs, and we're actually going to probably get one here on the show one night and actually look at it and go through it, but we use what's called APs, uh, audio precisions. And if you've got a full decked out AP with all the different filter loads and banks and things that go along with it, you can have about $50,000 in a full AP testing setup. And so what I've got here on the screen that I'm showing you, this is actually a test sheet of all the different areas and criteria that kick, a kicker amplifier has to be tested and passed. Now the, the thing that's on here, you'll notice we've got, there's gonna be targets and limits or there's ranges, and what a lot of people don't understand about electronics is all the parts that are used to build anything electronic have a tolerance. Uh, you know, it's either plus and minus half a percent, plus and minus one percent, plus and minus three percent, plus and minus five, 10. There's lots of different tolerances. And the tolerance of those parts it just means if I'm going to specify a 1K, 1K resistor as this is the part that goes in this slot, I'm going to specify that part. Maybe I'm saying, okay, if I'm within plus or minus 5%, this amplifier will work fine and meet all the specs I'm stating, so I can use a 5% tolerant part. Uh, or maybe I need to use a 10% tolerant part. Uh, the tolerance on parts, the, 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 the smaller you go, so I guess the more, I guess the right way to say, the more precise the part becomes, so like a 1% tolerant part, you can have a 1K, 1% resistor versus a 1K, 10% resistor, and the 1% resistor is gonna cost you a lot more money. And it's because it's a, it's a bin part, it's graded, it's built to a higher standard, they're hand tested, they're pulled out, they're batched out. Uh, it, I don't wanna say it's the exact same thing, but it's kinda like when Intel builds all the CPUs, they all come off the same die, but some of them just happen to work faster than others because some of the trans Transistors are, some of them may or may not be good or bad, uh, and that just happens. And so you're always looking at when you build anything electronic, where do I meet the specifications I want to meet all the time with every amplifier versus I'm just putting money in the amplifier I'm never going to see again. And so that's where you kind of come in to see where there's these ranges. So when we say an amplifier, it's not just a hard number in the sand, there's actually a range because you have to account for, well, if an amplifier mysteriously goes down the assembly line one day and it gets all plus 5% tolerant parts, well, that's a great thing. It's going to be above its build. But if you get another amplifier that runs down the assembly line, it happens to magically you get all minus 5% parts, you also need to make sure that amplifier meets your specifications. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, 100%. So this sheet here, you can see this is a whole list of things that we go through. You can see there's standby current, idle current, and this is actually, this isn't this 800.1 that we're testing, but this is a CXA 800.1 amplifier that was run through the testing. And you can see we test the THD at half power. Uh, half power is really, for most listening experiences, a typical power level that most people are dealing with. Uh, the, the volume level that people use and everything. Half power and third power are two numbers you see spoken about a lot, even in pro sound, is you might look at this amplifier that's 3,000 watts, but they'll talk a lot about one third and one half power because with music, that's the area where typically that amplifier is operating. And so you see here, we tested at half power at four ohms. Uh, our, our target is it has to be less than 0.15% THD. You can see this particular amplifier came in at 0 0.046, so it's well below the THD. THD standard that we've got. We test the low level sensitivity input. We test the high level sensitivity input. Uh, Tim just told me the AMM one timed out, so I'll have to put that thing back on, but you can see the amp still running and you can see the O-scope still running, so hopefully that's good. And by the way, we're at 847, so that thing's been sitting there cooking for six minutes. And it's still going. And we're gonna go on down here a little bit. You can see we look at signal to noise ratio at minimum gain. Uh, and reference that to 300 watts and look at it well. It, the spec is it's got to be at least uh, 95 dB. You can see there it's 113.3. And then uh, one watt, which is a CEA rating, it's got to meet at least negative 75 dB. We meet ne minus 87.4 on this particular amplifier. Uh, fit, this is the uh, CMR sweep. Uh, this has to do with the common mode noise rejection, which has a lot to do with the balanced input circuitry. Uh, it's a reference number, negative uh, 46.2. They, they know what that means back in R&D. I'm gonna tell you, I don't know what that reference is as far as good or bad. I just know they have a point where that has to reference and negative 46.2 I know is good, because I think I hear them talk all the time like 30 or up. 
So there's a number there. You can see as far as power testing, we test this amplifier at 4 ohm at 1% at 11.5 volts. We test it at 2 ohm and 1 ohm as well. We test it at 4 ohm, 2 ohm at 14.4 volt. Uh, it has to meet or exceed all these specs. You can see here it's, it's got to be greater than 300 watts. It actually did 364.9. At 2 ohm, it's got to be greater than 600 watts. It did 636.3. Uh, current draw at 2 ohm mono, 1%. Uh, 54.3 amps, which is very respectable. Uh, efficiency, I actually, I went past it there, hold on a second. Uh, efficiency at two ohms mono 1%, it has to be greater than 75%. So, uh, you know, that's pretty uh, interesting that it's gotta be greater than 75%. That's our low point. Uh, which I know you test amplifiers all the time and look at efficiency numbers and, and things like that. This amplifier actually passed at 81.4%. Uh, one ohm power, it's gotta be greater than 800 watts. This particular amplifier uh, passed at 881 watts and that was at 1% THD at 14.4 volts DC. Uh, short circuit protection, over voltage protection, all these different things, you know, it's either a go, no go, pass, no pass, or it's a range. So over voltage protection, it's got to be in the 15.5 to 16.5 range. You can see that this amplifier here, 16.2 uh, on the on the one, 15.6. Um, so these are all other tests that we put the amplifier through. And then when you look at it in a graph form, give you an idea. So like here is, this is actually the THD plus noise power graph at two ohms mono. And as you can see, the amplifier starts off way down here where it's making less than one watt of power, you know, way down here, like five, half a watt of power. And the distortion goes at 0.1%. It climbs up a little bit, then it drops down drastically when you get to one watt. The distortion keeps dropping down. You get up here into the 10 to 20 watt range. You can see distortion is down there in that 0.01% range. And then you start increasing power. Of course, THD starts rising. And you get to up here, which is around 407 watts. That's where the knee in the curve is. And that's where it starts taking off and distortion starts rising, which is what an amplifier does. Once it reaches its limits, if there's no more power supply, there's no more headroom in the output devices, your distortion starts climbing and going through the roof. And so you can see here as it's climbing up and going through the roof, the target right there is one point, that's 1.28, so that's right at 1%, and it was at 407 watts in this particular test. And so these are graphs that, you know, our guys, they, they create these graphs, they save these graphs, they put them in these Excel spreadsheets so that we have kind of a roadmap to when we're designing this amplifier, what's, what's it supposed to do, what's its targets, how well is it doing? You know, here's the CMR response. So this is the common mode noise rejection. You can see here how well it rejects noise coming in over the balance inputs all the way across from 20 to 20 kilohertz. And you can see it does extremely well at rejecting noise coming into the amplifier. So these are all things that we look at in amplifier design. And then go even into the crossover bench where, you know, we say, like, here's the low pass crossover. We, we say it's 50. That's what it's marked. That's what we market the product as. It's got a 50 hertz low pass crossover point. And the range has got to be 45 to 55. So we say it's 50, but it has a tolerance. So it can be between 45 and 55. If it's below that or above that, then it's a no-go. And this amplifier, you can see it was at 51.4, so well within tolerance. Check the slope, 12 dB, it's 11.7, so that certainly passes. Uh, low pass crossover, 200 hertz. It's got to be between 180 to, 200, to 220. This one came in at 194.7, so that's pretty darn close. Uh, low pass slope, it's got to be 12 dB on this particular, it's 12.1. So as you can see, these are the other things that we test. We test the bass boost, the center frequency, the crossovers, and then again, if you go into the graph side of the, the house, you can see this is actually the response graph showing how the curves work. And so these are other things that we look at when it comes to amplifier design. Besides just how many watts does the amplifier make, we wanna know, does it pass all these other things? And then you get into here, uh, amplifier delay, turn on, muting circuit times, because the last thing we want is the amplifier to be on before all the other electronics in the car, the radio, EQs, DSPs, make sure they stabilize before the amp kicks over. You don't want to hear turn on or turn off pop. We check for all that. Uh, the muting circuit, we check for that. We check for the DC offset, how much it takes to turn the amplifier on. That's necessary if you're interfacing into a factory system. Turn on delay, turn off delay, how much voltage. You can see we test and design for a whole range of things in an amplifier besides just how many watts does this amplifier make. And it's important to see this to understand that there's more to amplifier design than just looking at how much power the amplifier actually produces. We want the amplifier to make every bit of power we tell you it does, but we also want it to do it cleanly. We want it to work in a noisy car environment and reject noise. We want it to have a good signal to noise ratio. We want it to have all those things that come along for the ride that determine what makes a 
good amplifier and you know just voltage is not what makes a good amplifier if you're concerned about how good it's going to sound how well it's going to work and how well it's going to be at rejecting noise in your car's environment which the chassis of the car is just a horribly horrible environment when it comes to noise and of course here's some thermal graphs you can see they've actually put some in here this is from the FLIR that they took some measurements they were doing these on and so I just thought it'd be interesting to show you this and I'm gonna go back to the StreamYard feeder and you can bring me back on. I thought it'd be interesting to show you this because it shows you the different areas that we test amplifiers or, and or design and target amplifiers to other than just how many watts it makes. Yeah, I think a good way to kind of put it into a layman's perspective is what you guys do if you watch Engine Masters and shows like that, you know, you're getting down to the nitty gritty of, um, seeing all the different specifications, whereas some people just want to see what the quarter mile is or, or you know, how fast it can go zero to 60 type thing. So the consistency that you're showing here shows that, you know, this is one of the reasons why when people compare a 800 watt amp from Kicker versus an 800 watt amp from Brand X that's sold on Amazon, it's hard to compare the two because the brand X that's on Amazon or whatever is most likely not been put through all these tests. It doesn't have to meet all the standards that kicker puts their products to. So yeah, it's, it's one of those things that this and also what Kip's doing right now, trying to fry this amplifier is showing you, you know, why you're paying a little bit more for kicker product because you're paying for everything that's going behind it. Okay, so that, I mean, I wish, I don't think there's any way I can get this on camera, which is horrible, but I can tell you, it's, uh, I'm at 151 degrees on the chassis of the Key 200.4, and when we started this run, we started it at 841, we are now at 855, so by my calculations, that's 14 minutes. So, so Big D, 14 minutes, at yeah. full rated output power. Yeah, I know. Uh, most would blow up at this point, or at least shut off thermal protect. The, uh, I'm looking at it through the FLIR. Maybe I can come around the table and get you a view, but I'm looking on the FLIR, and it's found the hot spot on there. It's 157 degrees uh, in about this area of the amplifier, so that's probably where the power supply is. The output devices are probably in that area. Oh, look at Tim. Man, he's my hero. So here's the FLIR close-up. If Ernie will go over to it. Yeah. So you can see on that amplifier, we're at 156 degrees on the FLIR. And, and no pun intended, it's still cooking. <laughs> Time to get out the egg. But there you go, that's off the FLIR. 157, 156, 157 degrees is what we're seeing on that coming off of the FLIR looking at the thermal graph. And I'm gonna let it run. I'm gonna let it run to the end of the show. So we started that at 841, we're now at 856. So we're a solid 15 minutes in. And the funny thing about this is, and I keep coming back to it, and I, and I gotta lay the blame for this squarely at your feet, Derek, because it's your fault, is when we did the original testing, it wasn't about the amps, it was about the wire capability. But the thing is, to show the wire capability, we had to take an amplifier and really stress test it out in order to draw the current to show what's going on with the wire. But knowing how we test the Nick amplifiers here, I wasn't worried about doing it. It just was no big deal to me. Yeah, it may squeal, it may do this, but I'm not, I'm not too worried about it. And if it does blow up, I know the guys in the back, I know I can bribe someone to fix me an amplifier. But I wasn't too worried about it. And this is another example of that is that we make products that not only make the power we say they're gonna make, we also do it to a standard that's clean, it's clear, it rejects noise, it's got great signal noise ratio, it's a fantastic product, but it's also designed to do it in the real world environment of a car with a customer who just wants to listen to and enjoy his music for one hour or two hours or three hours or whatever he's doing out on the highway. That's what this gear is designed for. And you know, would I recommend this test for a lot of amplifiers? No, I wouldn't recommend doing what I'm doing right now, but as you can see, I hope you can folks, is this is a key 200.4, we're now coming up on 17 minutes of running at full sine wave output power and there is no test more abusive on an amplifier than full sine wave power at low frequency uh, and we're doing it right here for you so hopefully you, you think it's pretty cool <laughs> I do think it's cool and it's uh, definitely something that would not 
a lot of the other amplifiers brands would not be able to do this. And I, you know, I even thought about Kip incorporating this in. I just need to have somebody that's closer to me that can repair stuff because I'm sure there's going to be a lot of damaged amplifiers. Well, if it's a kicker amplifier that gets damaged, I know someone can help you out. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. I'm not too worried about the kicker. It's the you know some of the others that I've that I tested and will continue to test moving forward. But yeah, this is impressive. Again, you know when when you're comparing apples to apples, you have to take into consideration things like this. If this amp is able to run for 15 minutes solid at 50 hertz, then you know, you're going to get years of reliability out of your car using this amp in your car because it's dealing with the temperature extremes. It's dealing with uh, the vibration. It's, it's just, they just build them super, super tough. So it's, uh, it's a stress test unlike any other that I've seen for an amplifier. You know, and a question, and I'm going to bring this up because I'm looking at the feed here as we're going through this. You know, uh, Kyle Sloan says, put it in a 100-degree trunk, then test it. We actually do, Kyle. Uh, we have a stress test environment we do in the back, which is actually alternators from a car uh, with a battery power supply, and we test it in warehouse, and then we do throw these in cars. And it's not unusual for kicker employees, for maybe a couple dozen of us during the prototype testing of a product, we'll get emails out and it's like, okay, we need you to throw this in your car and run it for two weeks. Just beat on it like you would if it was anything else. We do those kinds of testing to the product. Now what's gonna happen is, in a room like this where the ambient temperature is you know, about 74 degrees, it's, it's going to run longer in here before it reaches thermal, but eventually this amplifier will reach thermal. That chassis is gonna to get to the point where it's too hot and then it's gonna go into thermal protection. If you're in a 100 degree trunk, it's also gonna happen. It'll just happen probably a little sooner than it would in an ambient air temperature of this is like, like 72 to 74 degrees. But we design for that, we take that into consideration, uh, and we make amplifiers run as long as we can, but we're also realist about it, and if you're in an environment where the temperature is way too hot, that's why I said in the beginning, we have a protection circuit that intentionally turns them off, because at that point, it's either let the solder flow and the parts fall off, or protect the amplifier. We choose to protect the amplifier, but you gotta go a long time to do that. Uh, we actually do a 24 hour thermal abuse test on every single design that we do here in the back in the warehouse. And the amplifier has to cycle on, it has to run at least an hour before it reaches that first cutoff time. And when they're being tested, it's full output sine wave, which is not music. These, these, this is an extreme test. And then once it hits that time, it has to be able to cool, it has to turn itself back on, and it has to sit there and cook and cycle for 24 hours and pass all of its tests and live before it is an approved design. We test them pretty hard. Yeah, I would say so, because if you think about it, you know, when you're using your vehicle, you're gonna be playing music, so that's well beyond the standard uh, use case scenario for an amplifier. Yeah, we're, I'm just testing here with the, the handheld meter. It's looking, we're up to about 160 degrees on the amplifier, roughly. I'm gonna just go around and take a look so I can see from the front. It's still making 50 watts of power. It's still a clean side wave, and we're still drawing no more. Well, there's, there it just went to 12, so we're drawing between 11 and 12 amps of current, and it's making all that power and doing it. And the whole key to that is we want someone to be able to put this in their car, get all the benefits of key technology, and, and enjoy it for hours in their automobile. And that's why we do this. And so now we're at 9.01. Um, we are at 22 minutes. We, are, we have now run this amplifier at full 50 hertz sine wave output for 22 minutes, or 20 minutes. No, 20 minutes, 22 minutes. Let me do the math on this, 41, 42, yeah, 22 minutes. We're coming up to 23 minutes on this. Can you believe, I, I mean, I'm a little shocked that I'm even letting myself get away with this. I mean, it's warm, it's hot, 160 degrees is hot. Ernie's back there laughing at me right now. Yep, it's hot. But yeah, there it is. So, Derek, you got anything to add? Do you have any questions about it? That's awesome. I, I mean, I felt like we kind of covered, you know, most of the different parts here of the test and kind of, um, you know, what's involved with the testing of the amplifiers and things that you need to take into account when you're uh, looking at these results, watching these videos or whatever. You have to understand that um, I'm not doing these real enhanced tests that Kicker does. We don't show that type, um, those type tests off yet, but it is it is important to understand that <laughs> that Kicker does it. So if you buy a Kicker product, you buy a Kicker amplifier, you'll know that they've been put through the ringer and that they are going to be reliable. Well, it's 
<laughs> I got to show this one. 25 hertz to live. The boss is going to call Kip and has to stop the amp test or get fired. <laughs> it's possible. <laughs> That's funny. So with that said, you know, if you wouldn't mind, hamburgers are good to eat. Hey, El Fuego. It's a grill. I could definitely warm my leftover steak up from dinner right now. That I can guarantee you. So with that said, I want to at least draw the winners because we're at 9.03. We've gone about three minutes long here. Let's do the giveaway and get that out of the way. Uh, if you don't mind, would you hang around with us, Derek, while we do the sure. giveaway? Sure. I will be All here. Right. Mr. Bill Brown, have we got three winners? Yep. Who's winner number three on tonight's show of Kicker Unmasked Live Weekly? Winner number three is Noah H. from Florida. Noah H. from Florida, congratulations, sir. You have just walked away with a Kicker Unmasked Live event T-shirt a pair of koozies to keep your favorite beverage below 160 degrees Fahrenheit, and a set of EB300 Bluetooth wireless earbuds. We hope you enjoy those. I'll tell everyone, winners right now, and I'll do it when we get to number one. What we need you to do is one of two things. Bill's gonna reach out to you tomorrow via email, or you can reach out to Bill right now by hitting him up at social at kicker.com. Either way, what we need from you is your mailing address, and it cannot be a P.O. box. We have to have a legit address. We also need your phone number. We say this every week, and we're sincere about it. We need your phone number because we have to put it in with the shipper information. That way, on their end, if they can't find you or they need to arrange for pickup or however it needs to work, they've got to be able to contact you. We do not share that phone number with anyone. We do not use it for any marketing purposes. It is strictly to fill in the box on the shipping information label. And we also want you to confirm your shirt size because we want to make sure in the drop-down box you did an excellent hit a schmedium when you meant an extra large or whatever like that. So make sure you confirm all that. You can reach out directly to Bill at social at kicker.com or he will be reaching out to you tomorrow via email. Look for it. Uh, respond to that email. You have seven days to claim your prize. Let's get that in your hands. Winner number two tonight, Bill. Winner number two tonight is Zach B from Missouri. Zach from Missouri, you are winner number two tonight. You're getting the exact same prize package. That's going to be one of the Kicker Unmasked Event T-shirts, like you can see over my shoulder. You'll get a pair of those koozies and a set of EB300 wireless earbuds. Zach, thank you for tuning in tonight. Hope you enjoyed the show. Look forward to seeing you next Tuesday on Kicker Unmasked Live Weekly. And last but certainly not least, the gentleman who's going to walk away with the big kahuna, a key 500.2 amplifier. Bill, who's that lucky winner tonight? Tonight's grand prize winner is Stephen S. from North Carolina. Stephen from Big NC. I know somebody from win NC. <laughs> <laughs> Go, Stephen. That's, that, that's not you playing I'm double dipping, is it there, No, Derek? that's not me. Go, Stephen <laughs> S. Stephen S. from North Carolina, you are our winner tonight for the grand prize. You're going to get the key 500.1. Sandy Rue has already got that up at her desk ready to ship out. It is not the amplifier we abuse tested tonight. You're going to get a brand new one in the box. Uh, you're going to get that. We're going to get you a couple koozies to go along with that. And, of course, the Kicker Unmasked Live T-shirt. Again, all our winners, you can reach out to Bill right now at social at kicker.com, or he will be emailing you tomorrow. Either way, we need address, no P.O. box, give us your phone number, and last but not least, confirm your shirt size so we get the right shirt into your hands. So, everyone, thank you for tuning in tonight. Thank you to our winners. Derek, what do you got to say before we roll out of this? I got to say thanks for having me on tonight, guys. It's been a blast. Uh, Kip, you did a great job not blowing up any equipment. And uh, yeah. everybody in the chat here was great to hang out with. Thank you guys for having me on as always. It's always a fun time. And thanks for making great products so we don't have to worry about it, right? You guys just make great stuff, so it's easy to recommend Kicker. You know, we really try to earn people's uh, respect, uh, and respect is definitely something's earned. Uh, I'm proud to work for the company. I think we make some fantastic products. I see what happens on a daily basis for research, de design, development. I see, you know, people who are here and are passionate about trying to get that product into here so we can get it out in people's hands. And if you got a problem, it happens, whether it's intentional or whether it's something that, you know, had a defect or a flaw. We have people here to take care of that. I'm, I'm proud of what we do here as a company. So uh, thank you for joining us tonight, Derek. We couldn't do a dyno show without having you on board. And I think we're going to try to do some more of these in the future. I think people get a kick out of these. I kind of like doing them live because it gets the you get to see what's going on behind the scenes. And if there's a mistake, we're going to show it to you anyway. Hey, great job there, kicker guys, handling and girls, handling everything for tonight. You guys are fantastic. Everything that you guys are seeing is not easy what they're doing here. They make it look easy. It's not easy. So you guys rock. Thanks again for having me on. 
Thanks, Derek. Thank you very much. And I think what I want to roll out with tonight is uh, I'm letting this amplifier roll. We're coming up on 908. We're coming up on 30 minutes of full output at a 50 hertz sine wave. I think we're going to make the 30 minute mark pretty close. Maybe Ernie will bring that up big screen and show that before we actually roll off the end of the night. But Derek, thank you for joining us tonight. It's a pleasure as always. I look forward to having you on the show again anytime. We love having you. Sounds good. Big D. I'm out of here.